to start going into my slides. Here we go. Perfect. So the title of my lecture today is about an inclusive politics of urban mobility. And I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, my co-presenter who is not present, uh, Professor Jason Henderson of San Francisco State. He's a professor of geography and environment. And together we co-authored this book called Street Fights in Copenhagen, Bicycle and Car Politics in a Green Mobility City. And uh, while we'll be speaking, or while I will be speaking uh, predominantly to this book today in the lecture, I would like to acknowledge uh, what's currently happening now in the world. Not only sort of the global pandemic with COVID and the kind of inequalities that we've seen as a result of that, where some of us are doing quite well and others are doing really not well based on previous inequalities and structures that have become even more heightened, but also um, the, the global protests, um, but specifically those happening in the United States around uh, racial inequality and police brutality with Black, Black Lives Matters, which, potent, which have um, a historic uh, perspective that also has to do with mobilities. Who gets to travel safely? Who gets to go certain places? Which mobilities matter and for whom? And what I'd like to say is that uh, in this tight case study of Copenhagen, we don't necessarily address these broader questions, yet I would really like to open up for that in our discussion and specifically bring that into the workshop and also the video discussion that we're going to be speaking about. So let me just plant those seeds now and um, we'll walk through this case study of Copenhagen, which will hopefully open up for a much broader discussion about terms like equity. So just a quick introduction to uh, Jason and I. Uh, so we met back in Portland in 1990 or, or 2007 at a car free conference when I was working as a transportation demand manager for Seattle Children's Hospital, where my goal was to kind of reduce car trips in the Seattle area. And Jason, he's always been an academic. 10 years later, we met again in Copenhagen uh, over beers and thought, okay, we actually need to talk about what's happening in Copenhagen because there's a lot of lessons to learn from the city, not in terms of just glorifying it, but actually thinking about the struggles, right? So every city, just as Devin just highlighted about the struggles in, in Bergen, have it, uh, very tense discussions about how to allocate street space. Who gets to use which space for what kind of mobility, right? And what's interesting is to think about kind of the similarities between what's been happening in Copenhagen, which is a very iconic green city, and other cities around the world. So that's what we try to do. We try to situate Co Co Copenhagen comparatively to try to open up this discussion for scholars, policymakers, advocates, because we don't just want to talk about how difficult everything is, but to actually outline a politics of hope and pathways for moving forward for sustainable and equitable mobility. So if you don't get anything else out of this lecture, here are some of the main takeaways. Uh, Copenhagen is an iconic bicycle and green mobility city. I'm sure many of you have been here or have at least seen images and photos of, of what happens here in terms of bikes. And we, we suggest that it provides a strong politics of hope. Yet there's much to learn from kind of these street fights or the political struggles that happen every day in Copenhagen around decisions about how to share or not share street space. And by talking openly about these struggles, uh, which are oftentimes kind of glossed over in the current literature, we hope to help other cities kind of learn more about how they can realize a stronger bicycle and green mobility culture. And when I'm talking about green mobilities, I'm talking about walking, I'm talking about uh, bicycling, I'm talking about public transit. So kind of low carbon alternatives. I'm not really talking about electric vehicles um, and we can touch on that later. later. Um, and I'd also like to suggest that we can learn from Copenhagen about an inclusive politics of mobility and I'll also touch on some of the current challenges to that inclusivity that we're facing here today. So I'll give you an overview, overview of the book and focus on some select street fights. I'll in the end kind of outline what this politics of hope look like and talk about how we are currently defending this inclusive politics of urban mobility in Copenhagen. So mobility and climate are 
are sort of a hot topic today, right? If we read through the IPCC reports, and if we look at what uh, protesters and policymakers have been saying the last uh, 10, 20 years, we're incurring, a, we're experiencing a climate emergency, right? And transportation is one of the most daunting topics here. 80% of global emissions come from, you know, a small portion of the globe, namely us in uh, Europe and uh, in the United States, North America, right? So the Global North has a lot of uh, action to take in terms of realizing that deep decarbonization that we're aiming for in uh, by 2030. And we also need to address inequities between Global North and Global South. And in order to do this, policymakers and, and experts are calling for deep structural change, not only shifting from the car to, to public transit and to bikes, but also thinking about transportation demand management. And that's a fancy way of saying that we need to take space away from cars, right? We need to get people out of their cars. And this isn't just about sort of having a compact green city. This is actually about global equity. And I think this picture sums it up quite nicely. This could be anywhere um, in the world. Um, but in, this is a common picture that we see where cars are just kind of overtaking, right? And in the US, we have car ownership rates of 800 per 1,000 people. In China currently, well, these numbers are a little bit outdated, but they're pretty, pretty um, accurate we only have 100 per 1,000 persons. And we know that that has accelerated rapidly. So what we're actually talking about is realizing completely new systems between 2020 and 2030 to make sure that we don't uh, overshoot sort of the planet's capacity to, to deal with uh, carbon. Now, when we're talking about these broader issues of global equity, why might we focus on kind of a tiny Nordic country like Copenhagen? Well. In sum, Copenhagen has a killer uh, reputation as a green mobility uh, city, right? With 29% of all trips in the city made by bikes, um, and another 25% made by public transit, and another 18% made by walking, uh, Copenhagen is a place where you want to be as a person, right? It's a truly hopeful city, and it shows politics of possibilities, right? Because there are actually struggles here in the city, yet Copenhagen has still achieved this kind of iconic green status. And every day there's kind of an impressive challenge to the car here. So there's a lot to dig into in terms of what has happened in Copenhagen and what we can learn from. This is a kind of an iconic image of what you can see. And for those of us who have been in Copenhagen or kind of experienced this, it's a lovely, lovely experience to sort of bike around the city. Uh, this is uh, the most, biked area of the city, Queen Louisa Bridge, with over uh, 48,000 cyclists crossing it each day. And this kind of iconic bicycle reputation has been strengthened by all the bicycle advocates who sort of flock to Copenhagen and the policymakers, whether it's from China or from South America or from the US, who are coming to kind of learn about how can we Copenhagenize our city, right? And this has reinforced that kind of strong brand of Copenhagen is, um, a bicycle oasis. And it's not only sort of advocates and policymakers who have, have strengthened this image, also academics have um, sort of flocked to the city to kind of study this best practice um, case study in terms of green mobility and, and cycling. So maybe the most well-read book, um, City Cycling by John Poocher and, and Ralph Bueller, sort of talks about Copenhagen as the world's best. Um, and Newman and Kenworthy, who are Australian scholars, they talk about it as a pinup city. And what they're really talking about is they're looking at the similarities in terms of mobility metrics, whether it's urban density or kind of transportation modes, um, and thinking about how other cities can actually achieve what Copenhagen actually has, right? And this isn't far-fetched because, okay, now we have an American-focused uh, table here, but if you focus on the density column, you look at Copenhagen, has a population of approximately 600,000 people, a density of 7,000 per, per square meter. LA, which is a very flat city for those of you who have been there. One neighborhood, which is Koreatown, uh, Westlake Hollywood, has a much higher density, right? So when we talk about sort of revolutionizing and making cities greener places, we always talk about density. LA, San Francisco, 
um, many other places in the world have high urban density and can achieve sort of this transition to trips quite easily, right? And if we look at kind of broader scales uh, within Europe, 50% of all car trips are under three miles, right? So that's uh, quite a significant number of car trips that actually could transition to another mode. Within the United States, 60% of all trips are under five miles. So we see this potential, and that's really what the academics have been focusing on in terms of best practice, that we have this opportunity for mode shift. Yet what oftentimes comes to, um, what oftentimes kind of stops this transition, and I hear this all the time from folks who come over from Seattle, for example, where I'm originally from, but we can't actually achieve this because the politics are so different, right? It's such a different political situation in the US, such a different political situation in Seattle. So what we actually do in this book is we bring up the politics of mobility. We show that there's actually a lot of similarities in terms of the political struggles in Copenhagen to achieve what we have achieved and will continue to achieve in the future and the political struggles that occur in other places. Um, and by focusing on these political struggles, we actually we hope open up for much more clear discussions and possibilities for policymakers and advocates to kind of figure out how they can realize and enable a cycling approach that has that appeals to such a broad swath of citizens and how it actually can be replicated in other places. But first, before I kind of dig into this political aspect, I think it's important to think about how Copenhagen actually became the place that it is today. So in chapter two of our book, we focus on um, the history of, of bicycling in Copenhagen. And what's important to think about is that when every part of the world was kind of um, captured by this bicycle craze, right? Late 19th, early 20th century. Copenhagen took the steps of actually working in um, a kind of coalition, um, uh, policymakers, um, advocates for the car, advocates for the bike, uh, they start, and engineers started working together, thinking about safety through separation. So Danes were actually the first ones to put in an engineer bicycle infrastructure and Copenhagen was one of the showcase areas. And um, so this idea that cyclists had to be killed or so forth was never accepted. It did happen, but it was stopped quite, quite quickly already in the 1920s. And this can be thought of as kind of a social democratic approach, right? So the social Democrats, which are the center left party in, Copen in Denmark. They were um, ruling at that time, both within Copenhagen, but also at the state level. And their approach is very much about consensus, about hearing everybody and about thinking about equity um, is, is kind of a main factor. What's also important in, in Denmark and in Copenhagen is that there never was a strong car industry, right? So if we look at our neighboring countries, Sweden to the north, Germany to the south, think about the United States, even think about China or India today, strong car lobbies are really shaping the politics of mobility. But Denmark, Denmark never had that. And so with, so with the social Democrats at the helm, um, cars were thought of as a luxury and they were taxed accordingly. So up until recently, uh, we had to pay a lot of money for cars, almost three times the price of the actual car because of the car tax. Um, and throughout sort of the 20th century, there's been kind of a strong left progressive politics that have continued the progression of the bicycle culture. Up until recently, um, there were protests in the 1980s, uh, 1970s and 1980s to actually increase the bicycle infrastructure. And what this has sort of manifested is kind of that glossy green image that we think of when we think of Copenhagen where um, we talk about kind of a social democratic approach to the welfare state. And this also applies to mobility. I don't know why it's doing that. Sharing, caring, collective solutions, egalitarian approaches. Yet what we would like to suggest is that something is kind of rotten in this glossy green approach, right? Something is rotten in Denmark. And I think this picture shows it all, that despite the fact that we have such high levels of bicycling, despite the fact that we have a lot of strong policies in place, we still see the car encroaching, right? The car is taking over the city. So while uh, trips, only 9% of trips in Copenhagen are actually made by car, 50%, 57% or almost 60% of all journeys that cross the city limits of Copenhagen 
are made by car. So what planners like to talk about is the city likes to cycle, but the region likes to drive. So we have that incredible pressure that's always um, around the city, both um, in terms of physical manifestation, but also a political manifestation. Uh, we also see a tight constraint around space for bicycles. So even though we have an enormous amount of space actually allocated to bikes in our city, if you actually ride at rush hour, can feel quite uncomfortable. And I can say this, I'm a mother to three kids. I have a 10 year old, I have a six year old and I have a newborn. It's quite uncomfortable at rush hour to kind of, you know, be in my cargo bike with the baby and then have the other kids riding in front of me because there's just a lot of stuff happening, both with buses, but with also different types of cyclists electric scooters, um, electric bikes traveling at different speeds. We see a disturbing trend where young people are um, hopping over from public transit and bikes into cars. And all of this is kind of bringing up a discussion of have we kind of stalled our potential here in Copenhagen, right? Can we actually achieve these broader visions of more than 50% of all trips being made by bike? Uh, which is the, the municipality's actual goal. Um, and at this point, what experts are saying is that the system is at capacity and potentially can't really absorb much more. Um, so 20, 28, 29% of all trips or 50%, 49% of work and job trips, right? Or education trips. So ultimately what we've heard in our interviews while writing this book is to increase cycling numbers, there is an actual need to increase an allocation of space to cycling infrastructure and space for cyclists. And this is what we suggest brings up street fights, right? This is where it gets dirty and gritty. And this is what cities all across the, the world are dealing with when they start thinking about how do we reallocate space to people. And in order to understand these street fights, we suggest that it's very important to kind of understand the ideologies or the politics of mobility. Now ideologies are kind of beliefs that steer political decisions, right? So in terms of an ideology, we suggest that there's three broad categories. And of course these are variegated and they differ depending on where you are in localities. But in broader strokes, we can talk about kind of a left progressive ideology, which thinks about mobility in terms of the role of government by reducing car space through direct government intervention. This means Public space should take precedence and we need to redistribute based on equity. We have a neoliberal ideology that very much um, suggests that the government should think about market-based solutions. So this should be based on pricing and efficiency. We should also potentially privatize and the market always provides the best solutions in terms of organizing. And here we suggest that the Social Democrats, which are generally kind of a left-leaning and center party, we, we categorize them as neoliberal together with Venstra, which is the right-leaning party, and with the Libertarian Party. So you might see some parallels here in terms of what's happening in your own cities. In terms of conservative ideology, um, this is a type of ideology that suggests government should basically preserve and prioritize this public space for automobility. There should be little to no pricing and that, you know, the automobile should really be essentialized as kind of a right and a way of life. And we definitely see this dominating in a place like the United States, for, ex for example. Now, I can give you some examples of how this plays out in kind of a Copenhagen or Denmark sense, but um, Venstra, which is the uh, center right party, right? They think about economic growth going hand in hand with the car. So if you see the new development that's happening in Copenhagen around kind of the post-industrial areas that are opening up to pay for the metro, all of these areas are first of all luxury housing, which are very inaffordable, and secondly, all have parking, one or two spaces per family. The conservative or kind of right-wing politics of the car or of mo mobility really essentialize the car in Denmark. And as soon as you get out of Copenhagen, you could actually feel like you were in the United States. Because um, you see uh, McDonald's drive throughs you see that every family has a car, and you kind of feel that uh, cars must be cheaper, and people want to start getting bigger cars. So this is uh, what kind of an average parking lot can look like in, in Denmark. And what's interesting here, the reason that I'm going through these concrete examples is because 
while Copenhagen is predominantly kind of a left-wing voting city, whereby we always have sort of the most left-wing party is our mobility mayor or an environmental mayor, and we've traditionally had a social democrat as our mayor in the city. What we see is that when it comes to mobility, the social democrats and all the parties that are right of them make a coalition. And we call this the right-wing neoliberal mobility consensus, meaning that there is a sort of a block against uh, congestion pricing or a toll ring, um, that there is a, a politics against removing parking. So in Copenhagen, uh, despite the fact that we're a biking capital, you can't take away parking spots without replacing it one-to-one. -one. And this is on-street parking. And this is absolutely against the kind of myth that we hear about that Copenhagen became kind of the bicycle capital that it is today because over time we just removed parking spots. That's absolutely not true. Um, just last year, the government basically drastically reduced parking charges for on street parking. So if you own a car and you live in the dense city center, you pay uh, basically like $100 a year to park on street. And they're creating more off street parking. Also, right now we have a consensus uh, between all government parties, not the ones to the left of the Social Democrats, to build a huge highway called the Harbor Tunnel, which will be underground. Um, and you might ask why we need to be doing this when we obviously have some pretty important climate goals and decarbonization goals to meet. So this political cons consensus might look like a consensus that you could see in many other countries, right? And this is what we have both in Copenhagen and in Denmark. So these are the flashpoints that I want to touch on in terms of uh, street fights. Uh, we've had a congestion pricing debate that is, of course, coming up again now that we have the Social Democrats back in control. We have a debate around on-street parking removal, off-street parking ratios, the harbor tunnel, and car taxes. So in terms of the politics of parking, I've already kind of touched on this, but you know, new housing has parking. And it makes the housing unaffordable because building parking spots is actually really expensive because not only are they on street or, you know, at street level here, but they're also underground to provide those additional spots. Um, models are showing that as more people move to Copenhagen, more parking spots will be needed because car ownership will go up. And the past 10 years that I've lived here, I've actually seen that more and more people are buying summer houses. So they have cars so that they can use them on the weekend. And when you have that car, you actually use it during the week sometimes too, right? So it's a slippery slope. Despite the fact that we have all these fancy climate goals that we need to meet here in Copenhagen, and we have sort of the greenest um, government in place that we've had historically, it's led by the Social Democrats. And when we did sort of a dissection of what happened back in 2011, last time the Social Democrats were in charge here in Denmark, and there were big promises of creating a congestion toll ring around Copenhagen, the Social Democrats ultimately fumbled, right? And it was a lack of consensus between what you can see is the city center, or the actual city of Copenhagen, marked in green there, and the outlying municipalities that felt very threatened by this idea of putting kind of a tax or a toll on um, coming into the city. And what we found out is that actually Social Democrats really love their cars. The Social Democrats at the national level were unable to make consensus with the Social Democratic mayors in the, sub the suburbs of Copenhagen because there's this idea that parents need to have cars in order to bring their children into the city and they should have a parking spot, right? And specifically like that single mom has to have a car in order to make things work. And this is despite the fact that Copenhagen has a completely well-functioning and affordable public transit system that's far reaching. Additionally, we've had um, sort of a flip from certain political parties, but most specifically the Social Democrats to um, spend you know, over 30 million uh, Danish kroner, and of course that price will just rise throughout time, to build an underground highway called the Harbor Tunnel. And this will connect kind of the new uh, post-industrial housing in Nordhavn, plus the, uh, what we call the Whiskey Belt, the northern coast of um, north of Copenhagen, um, to sort of the airport and the highway outside of Copenhagen. So kind of classically skirting around the city in order to increase kind of the mobility of those with higher means. And what this actually will impact is that um, some of the Natura 2000 area that we have in Copenhagen, which is quite spectacular with a lot of red 
uh, red listed species will be dug up and will it add additional kind of emissions so that we can have um, a highway exit coming out right where this green area is and a lot of new housing is. So this is actually kind of an issue of environmental justice in many ways, not only about the rights of species, but also air quality. We also see that because of this politics of the car being supported by right wing and social democratic neoliberal consensus, that uh, urban planning in Copenhagen is now based on kind of expanding the city in less than sort of green mobility friendly ways. So most recently, this idea of Luneta home or expanding the city out into the harbor by building different islands with a refuge from current development projects has been um, approved by that right wing neoliberal consensus. And currently, it's not clear how um, this new population and this new development will actually sort of be fit with green infrastructure. So the city is spreading. There's also kind of a, a fight around funding for public transit. Uh, we, re we recently expanded our metro system here in uh, Copenhagen, and we have an excellent bus system. Yet because of the expansion of the metro, money has been taken away from the bus system. And this is also kind of a classic move that we see happening uh, across cities that trains uh, take over um, funding, buses get defunded, and now actually because of COVID, all public transit is sort of experiencing a budgetary crisis because nobody is riding it, or the numbers have gone down drastically, we would say. So we, we will just have to watch and see in terms of what happens there with budgets and policy. Yet despite these struggles that we would suggest could be seen in any city, we would like to suggest that Copenhagen provides a politics of hope because despite these kind of political transportation struggles, I don't know what's happening with my slides, um, Copenhagen has still achieved these kind of spectacular outcomes, right? There is, however, a tendency to kind of over glamorize Copenhagen's iconic status. And that's what we would like to kind of remove that glossy green status. We'd like to look at what's actually happening, get down into the streets, understand the fights, and then suggest that despite the fact that Copenhagen has these challenges, they've still been able to achieve these kind of exceptional numbers, right? So what can we actually learn from that? Well, this is what we suggest is the politics of hope. And if we sort of analyze what has happened in all of those street fights, we can see that there's a left progressive politics of mobility that has really sort of pushed these progressive policies through. So there's been a strong challenge to neoliberalism, a redistributive approach, and an ethical kind of responsibility around equity and mobility. So our parties to the left of the Social Democrats have been focusing on a car-free city life, leaving the car at home, and decarbonizing, right? And the goal is to reach a 50% bicycle mode share, to have social housing that links with transit that links with affordable mobility, um, to have kind of a car free or car light housing. And I would suggest that Denmark and, and Copenhagen in many ways have achieved this status. Um, it is very, um, you, there's a lot of folks who live in Copenhagen with different income levels. And that is only possible because there is affordable social housing built into the system and it is transit oriented. This is something that we can learn from in many other cities because despite our calls for kind of deep transit um, or for deep mo mo uh, modality shifts and for thinking about deep decarbonization, we can't do that without providing affordable housing. The two go hand in hand. And so in that regard, Copenhagen is a very interesting case study that provides insights into kind of broader issues of justice and equity, right? How do we make green mobility accessible for everyone? How do we get past kind of the threat of green gentrification, which is a, a topic that comes up all the time when we talk about increasing bikeability in cities. Now, despite the fact that Copenhagen is an interesting case study, we always have to defend this kind of um, accessible and equitable and just mobility, right? So currently the, uh, the previous neoliberal kind of right-wing government passed a very controversial ghetto law, right, in Denmark, meaning that social housing areas that are disproportionately populous, populated with non-Western immigrants, that could be somebody that comes from the United States, but is most 
specifically focusing on Muslim residents who might be Danish citizens, might not be Danish citizens, but if they have a non-Western background and there's over 40% of that population living in a social housing area, then they can fall into this kind of hard ghetto list. And if you're on that list for over five years and haven't made any progress, then housing can be removed or torn down. So, and then sold off to private entities. So in many ways, this is like a backdoor way of using xenophobia to gentrify neighbors and or neighborhoods and to privatize what has been a collective good for so long in Denmark. And we see that happening. And currently what's very inspirational is that this housing area in Nørrebro, which is at this heart of Copenhagen, is now fighting this through a legal battle. They're, they're um, suing the state and calling this kind of law racist, as it actually is, and trying to um, uh, use European law to actually, and also the Danish constitution to challenge it. But these kind of challenges are very real. Um, we also need to think about carbon gentrification. And I would suggest this is a broader issue, not only in Copenhagen, but other cities as you know, we urbanize, densify, prices go up and then folks need to move out. So I have a, a picture here of the finger plan in Copenhagen, which is a very iconic kind of idea of thinking about the, the structure of the city. And what we can see in the next picture is sort of spreading of population, right? So as housing prices go up, more and more families and, and young people are having to move outside of the city. And the price of that is that many people are getting cars because car prices have gone down. The last neoliberal government, right-wing government, they cut the car tax. So it's become much more affordable to buy cars in Denmark. And what we see is that more and more people are buying cars. Yet, what we also see is a push in Copenhagen to ban diesel vehicles and to provide a lot of benefits for electric vehicles. So in fact, the city council has passed um, a policy saying that electric vehicles now have free parking in the city. And what I think we need to think about in this kind of debate is who gets to live in the city then, right? I'm not suggesting that we should have a lot of cars in the city, yet, electric vehicles are very expensive. And if we're providing extra benefits for electric vehicles, we're providing extra benefits for those who actually have a high enough income to purchase those, right? So we need to think about um, the, the kind of the politically embedded processes of changing the social and spatial composition of urban quarters through these kind of pricing charges, right? So this is another way of gentrification, another way of kind of thinking about low carbon, low carbon neighborhoods as being quite exclusive. Who gets to live there? Who can pay the price? Who gets pushed out? And I would also like to suggest that these ideas are ideologically driven. Um, and it's focused on kind of an idea of tech mobility and smartness as being, um, as being kind of the way to move forward. And with that, I would like to actually end the lecture because I wanna make sure that we have time for questions. I can see that I've actually gone a bit over my, my lecture time, but I'd like to open up for questions um, and also suggest that we could take it beyond Copenhagen and, and talk about some of these other topics that I raised at the beginning of the lecture. So thank you. Anyone would like to go first? First, um, thanks for the for the lecture. Um, I'm interested in the in the role of the social democrats, and if I understand correctly, how they initially played a role in installing a bike culture, but they now seem to be Kind of fighting the bi uh, bike culture, and I was wondering whether you think that is a result of a change in their politics, or whether what is required now is more radical than what was required back then. Hence, they're not able to to follow. That's a great question, and it provides an opportunity to clarify something. Whereby I would suggest that every single political party in Copenhagen and in Denmark is bicycle friendly. So none of them would argue against the bike. The question is how much space are they willing to allocate from cars to bikes and people mobilities, right? So the social Democrats are 
fully supportive of bicycles. But when it comes to actually allocating space and taking sort of that political stance, currently they're much more sort of favorable for cars. And I would suggest that has to do with their kind of pragmatic um, model of, of seeing economic growth. I would suggest going back to that kind of um, political um, mobility uh, slide that I showed, or the politics of mobility, that they're very neoliberal in their thinking, so that their ideology, and this has been written about across Europe, actually, in terms of social democratic parties, that the social democrats in many ways have kind of lost focus on the uh, working person in terms of what they might need in their day to day and the struggles of the working person and have focused more on kind of economic growth, whereby a lot of folks have kind of fallen out of at the bottom. Right. And this is why we've seen the social democratic parties. I mean, Germany is a very common example kind of crumbling. We also see it happening in Sweden. I'm not really sure how it is in Norway, um, but it could be a similar trend as well. And we see other parties coming in and kind of filling that gap. So in, in Copenhagen, we have four other parties that are to the left of the Social Democrats that really fill that gap, kind of advocating for the much more radical transformations that you're suggesting are needed. So there's a tension there. It, the Social Democrats really want to be green, but they're not really willing to give up their love of the car. And I think it's just very pragmatic. They see the car as kind of the key to prosperity. And, um, you know, fitting, fittingly, now it's the electric car that's supposed to help us with our carbon transition in, in Denmark. And if I might just kind of extrapolate on that, if we think about why Donald Trump was interested in Greenland nine months ago or 10 months ago, which became kind of a, a laughing stock on the internet, it's not very laughable because electric cars actually demand lithium for their batteries, right? Where do we have mines for lithium? Well very few places in the world, but Greenland is actually one of those places. So there's kind of a global tension now around shifting systems from oil to electricity. And where do those, where does the power come? Where does the energy come for those shifts? That's going to be kind of one of the new frontiers, I would suggest, political struggles. And more than just a street fight, <laughs> it's gonna be a broader fight. If I can can jump in, I, I I really like your perspective here because we, we um, in this debate we typically think of Copenhagen as a sort of yeah <laughs> romantic ideal of, of how um, a, a city can be sort of immersed in bicycle culture and we sort of describe it almost like it's it's in it's in the DNA of people in Copenhagen, but it really has to do with kind of it's something that has been fought for and it's, it has to be continuously fought for and fought over. Uh, and it's being challenged. I think that's a, that's, that's a very important uh, perspective in the, in, the, in the wider debate. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you emphasize uh, parties and ideologies uh, a lot. I wonder if it's uh, how, what the role of sort of, um, sort of cultural politics uh, is in this sort of uh, people identify with the bicycle or people identify against the bicycle. You, have, you know, you have have mm -hmm. people living in certain urban areas where they they, they 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 have this identification of being green and sustainable and urban and and they are the ones who typically bike and then you have these other groups who are kind of in opposition to that and want to emphasize their our culture sort of that so it's, there's also a cultural politics of this which i see in other places totally and i i think if there's you know a gap that we didn't necessarily focus on because i would suggest that maybe many other scholars have looked at this is more of an ethnographic approach right what is the kind of everyday experience of a bicyclist in copenhagen and why is it that folks feel so comfortable just jumping on their bikes so i guess i'll talk about this at a few different levels what we thought the literature gap that we should cover was was that kind of political fight, right? But that political fight is kind of up here. And of course it has to do with people's everyday choices, but what we like to think about is kind of more of a structural approach. Yet that structural approach also needs to be coupled with an understanding of kind of everyday experiences and lived experiences. And this is where you can start to kind of complicate again, that picture of Copenhagen, because what you see on the, the bicycle lanes and Sid, I know, you know, we did our PhDs together in Copenhagen. It's a pretty white picture. So while there still are a lot of um, Muslims, um, African immigrants, people of color and different ethnicities living in Copenhagen, you don't necessarily always see them riding bikes, right? A lot of um, first generation immigrants are um, driving taxis, specifically younger men, they're driving taxis. And then um, there's programs 
to help um, first generation um, immigrants get on bikes. Um, but there's kind of lower numbers there. And that's a real interesting question about what is the everyday lived experience if you don't come from a culture that really kind of supports bikeability. And if you haven't like grown up with it is sort of the thing that you should do. Um, I think there's some interesting research to be done there and to think about. And I think that expands to kind of other cities that it's not only kind of a political str struggle, it's also kind of a cultural process. And in Seattle, when I was working in transportation demand management, I actually called my job like transportation therapy, because what I did is I sat down with folks every single day working at this hospital and talking about what was their daily commute? How many kids do they have? Uh, what sort of resources do they have? How could we actually get them onto a bike or into a carpool or riding the bus? And what I saw, what I witnessed in that point is that it's really important to kind of have subsidies. Our hospital actually paid for people's bikes. So I could give away a free bike. I was able to teach them how to ride a bike. We gave them free bus passes. We paid for the carpool. And this kind of goes back to that liberal progressive ideology that of course it's about individual choices and it's about understanding everyday struggles and perspectives. Yet if you don't have that kind of economic redistribution and focus on everybody having access to this choice, you can't see the two working out, right? Um, so I guess that's, that's how we see it in this perspective is that you need both. I guess I'll, I'll just close off this session because I'm, I'm aware of the fact that we should take a break pretty soon, but maybe just planting the seed to thinking about, okay, in light of the challenges that we're facing with COVID and the, the recent protests that we've seen, repeated protests, I should say, um, for Black Lives Matter, and I would suggest kind of thinking about more just mobilities. How can we kind of expand the discussion that we've just had here and sort of some of the points that have been brought up into kind of thinking through those just possibilities in the future. So these are some of the ideas that I hope we can take up in our next session in the workshop and continue into our video session as well. Uh, so why don't we meet again at 10 o'clock and hopefully all of us can get a cup of coffee. Thank you.